Good morning. Welcome to praise today. Please stand with us as we worship the Lord. Well, good morning and welcome. It is good to be gathered again today in air conditioning, right? This is the first time we've had to turn the air conditioning on in the church, and that's always like that's always a, a, an amazing time of the year to realize that summer is here. 
Uh, it'll go back to like spring in, in uh, tomorrow, I think, right? But we'll enjoy it for today. For those of you joining online, welcome. We're glad that you could be with us as well. And uh, we have a couple of announcements as we get started today. First and foremost, we have a quarterly business meeting after church today. So um, any members, we're inviting you to stay and, and to be part of that. Uh, we have some updates on, on things that are happening with our ministries and uh, looking forward to our ministries as well. Going into the fall, we have some things to discuss, things to talk about. So please, um, if you're a member, stay. Um, if you're not a member, but, uh, but you call Praise Home and you want to see what it is that we value, what it is that we're doing, we invite you to stay as well. And just to be able to hear what it is that, that we are doing, what we're up to, what we're looking uh, toward, what we're praying for, and how God is moving. So that's after our service this morning. Um, Tonight at 7 o'clock, there's a young adults meeting, uh, college, uh, college age and up here at the church, 7 o'clock. On Wednesday the 25th, we have a blood drive, uh, the one we've been promoting in honor of Lindsay Sablowski. Um, so uh, we have all the volunteers we need, so that's good, but we're still, we could still use some refreshments. Debbie, is that true still? Sure, sure, yes, sure, yes. Ooh, are there ever too many refreshments? Probably not. Um, so that's going to be, um, again, on Wednesday. Um, if you can bring refreshments for there, if, if there's something that you, uh, you can bring, if you could talk to Debbie, Debbie's going to have her hand raised right there. You can find her after the church service. Uh, I'm sure she'd love to point you in a good direction. Um, also on Wednesday, there's, uh, the youth group is going to be meeting in the evening here. Um, we're going to be, our youth groups are going to be closing up on June 15th for the year, but we're looking to plan a couple of events that go through the summer. Just people's schedules, they're all over. Um, it gives us a little bit of a break in the summer, but we still want to have times for us to gather together, just so you know. But there is youth group this upcoming weekend. Um, this upcoming Saturday, we have a men's breakfast at the Log House at, uh, starting at 8 o'clock. If you're interested in that, please let me know. It's just good to know how many chairs we can uh, get set up for the room that they hold for us there. So, But everybody's invited. If you haven't been, come. It's just a good time for us to get together, have breakfast, and to, uh, to enjoy uh, one another's fellowship as well. And um, last announcement, on Sunday, May 29th, I'm going to read this one. Uh, so I didn't know, I've met Lorinda Ritz once, so Mike and Lorinda Ritz will be visiting uh, Praise as they're in Connecticut for Mike's medical assessment for a brain, his brain tumor. So Mike and Lorinda were very active at Praise when they lived in Connecticut, and they'd love to be able to visit uh, with people who knew them and while they attended Praise before moving to Arkansas. So Debbie, she's been very busy with food stuff, has booked a back room of the log house um, so that for the, anyone who would like to have lunch with them and visit um, is welcome. So it, you're, everybody can order off the menu. It's going to be that kind of thing. But uh, RSVP with Debbie, if that's something you'd like to be at, um, so that we can, uh, we can give a correct number to the log house for the people that would be there. So anybody's welcome to go have lunch with Mike and Lorinda. Again, you can see Debbie. And also her contact information is in the bulletin. So you can also, I think the phone number, is there a phone number in there? So that means prank calls. Right? That's what she's opening herself up for. Um, <clears throat> that's, at least that's what I take it as. Right, Debbie? Um, so we have a, a tremendous opportunity just to worship our King, our God, the one who loves us so much. And so our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 66, verses 1 through 4. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing glory, the glory of His name. Give to Him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Would you pray with me? Father, we're so grateful that we can gather into your presence this morning and we can hear your word as it's spoken to our hearts. Lord, Lord, we can lift our voices as we remember what it is that you've done for us, for Christ's death and resurrection, to forgive us, to, to justify us before you, to count us as, as pure and holy. Lord, we're not that on our own. Uh, but this is a declaration that Jesus makes concerning us, and Lord, we are so grateful for that. So, Father, it's with joyful hearts that we sing, and so receive our, our praise this morning as we lift our voices to you. And again, Father, speak to our hearts so we can hear your word uh, speaking into our lives, telling us what you have for us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare your our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've 
be seated. Because you are not, you are with me, I will not fear. Amen. Our scripture verse comes from Acts 16 verses 9 through 15, reading in Jesus' name. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man in Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and following day to Naples, 
and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in the city some days, and on the Sabbath day we went outside to the gate to the riverside where, where we supposed there was a place of prayer and sat down to spoke to, to the women who had come to gather. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thy Thytra, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper, a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. This is the word of the Lord. All right, so now, now we'll get back down to a normal level. There it is. All right, um, well, I really struggled with preaching this text because it was about Lydia, my daughter. I was going to make it all about her, but instead we'll just stick with the text. How's that? Um, this, this text, a lot of times I read it and you wonder, there's so many little things inside of here that, that talk about God's grace, but there's one big picture. There's something that we can see for us, what it means for us as we draw close to the Lord, as we understand who we are as His people. Um, there, there's something for us in here that might be a little scary to you, but it's a call to us from Scripture to preach the gospel to preach the gospel. And we'll see how this, how this extends to all of, us, all of us as we go through this. So before we start, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you for this word before us, Lord, that you will do your work through it. Lord, we thank you that you change people's hearts. You bring them from death to life, that you restore through your word. And God, we're so grateful for that. And so do your work this morning through, the, through us as you send your Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, when I was back in college, I remember that Pastor Warren would, um, he would encourage me to go to seminary. And um, I had my plan at the time, I was at UConn, um, my, my background or my degree was in human development and family studies, and I was looking to do uh, marriage and family therapy, that was, that was what I wanted to do. And so Pastor Warren would always ask me, hey, do you wanna, why don't you consider seminary? And so, so I, um, I would always say, I would always say, yeah, I'll, I'll pray about it. And um, for those of you who have ever used that word or that phrase, you know as well as I do that that's just the Christian no. <laughs> yeah, I'll pray about it. And it makes you look like you're actually concerned with, with what they're proposing, but you're really not going to do it, so you pray about it. So, so I kind of, I apologize, Pastor Warren, I, but I think you know what I was doing. I said I will pray about it. And I didn't really want to go to seminary. Um, I didn't want to go get a master's degree. I didn't want more school. But the biggest thing was I didn't want to pay for it. That was my biggest reason for not wanting to go to get a master's degree was, was paying for it. I, did, I was going to be in debt from, uh, from UConn. And uh, I just didn't want more. I just wanted to be able to, to go start working and, and have my career. And that's not something that I told anyone. I didn't tell anyone that that's the reason that I didn't want to go to seminaries because I didn't want to pay for it. Didn't utter a word to anybody, not my family, no one. I didn't tell anyone. Now, the summer before my senior year, I was volunteering at Tuscarora, which I had done for, for many years at, at Teen Week. And um, I was talking to one of the directors we were walking, I distinctly remember, we were walking by the volleyball courts, and he had asked me a question. He's like, so what are your plans for, for after you graduate? And I said, well, I'm going to go get my certificates and, and all the stuff that I need, the licensing for marriage and family therapy, and, and then I'm, I'm going to find a job, I'm going to work and, and do that. And, and I don't know why I said this. I have no idea why these words even came out of my mouth, but I said, and I'm also kicking, out, or kicking around the idea of going to seminary. I don't know why I said that. I had already given the Christian no. But now, I wasn't really considering it. I don't know why I said it. I really, I really can't get behind it. But so this, this person that I was talking to, he said, oh, that's awesome. I tell you what, we need pastors. If you go, I'll pay. <laughs> and I think the next words were, ah, shoot. <laughs> no, at that moment... I, I, I had these just these thoughts, like run, all these things running through my mind, like why did I even say that? Why did I even bring that up? Why? why? 
Regardless of why I said it, God used it for a purpose. He was doing something that I wasn't aware of. And he used this, this man who, by the way, paid for my whole education. What a blessing. Um, I also had the support from praise at the time, and I had support from others. I didn't, I didn't pay for anything. I hardly had to pay for my own books. Such an incredible blessing. God just opened up a door to send me to go to seminary. That was the one obstacle that I had for not wanting to go, and God removed it because He was showing me, He was revealing to me what is next for me. He was leading my way. He was guiding my steps. It was Him who was making a straight way for me. Now, I can't help but to think that God used that moment and that friend of mine, that His voice, His literal voice, to call me into ministry. He used his words that I can remember as clear as day to lead me in a direction, to call me in a direction. In fact, I I often call that moment the divine boot in the rear because there there was no guessing as to whether or not this was from God. It wasn't a question. So God used this voice to send me and God speaks through so many people by the power of His Spirit that He uses to do incredible things for His kingdom's sake. Now, in this text for this morning, we see and and hear the account of the Apostle Paul who sees a vision. He sees a vision. And it's more than just a a, a dream or something. He sees this vision. In verse 9, it says that he saw a man of Macedonia, Macedonia standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now this was more, again, than just a dream. This isn't just a dream. This was something that was given to him, as we'll see from the rest of the, of the rest of the text. This was more than just, uh, you know, an imagination. It was actually a voice. Another way that God speaks. It was a supernatural communication from God himself leading Paul in a direction, giving him a direction to go in. Now, up until this point, God had been uh, leading Paul already on his missionary journeys, but Paul wanted to go in certain directions, and God was saying no to him. He was closing doors. He was keeping him away. He was forbidding him to go to Asia. He stopped him from going into Bithynia, which if you read in the, in the verses uh, before this, um, he stopped him from going into Bithynia, and then he ended up in Troas, This place that he didn't really want to go, but he ended up there. Now, like the rest of us, if Paul had his plan of where he wanted to go, um, if he had his his hard and fast setting of where he was going to be and he ran through it, uh, sometimes we run into problems that way. But God didn't give him the opportunity. He shut doors and he guided him to one particular spot, this place in Troas, And in in that, in that guiding, he was making his way straight. Go to Macedonia. Go to Macedonia. That became the call, the voice to him to go to a particular place. Though Macedonia isn't where Paul wanted to go or planned on going, it's where he goes nonetheless, and and it's where he goes with a purpose to help the Macedonians. He goes to help the Macedonians. Now, it's easy to think, I mean, um, if for any Star Wars fans, what, what, is, what does Princess Leia say in the hologram? Help me, Obi-Wan, you're our only hope, right? And we think about what the help meant, you know, there's those old kinds of things with what, what help is. And um, in the context of short-term missionary trips with, uh, or mission trips with the church, help can mean a whole lot of things, right? Um, I know... Uh, we went, we've gone on to mission trips down in Guatemala, and it was funny. Uh, a friend of mine uh, from, from our church up in, up in Heartland, this guy Kevin, is a really, really funny guy. And we were just having this, this picture of us, us two gringos walking down the streets of Guatemala with like the 10-gallon cowboy hats and six shooters and, and just like handing out money. 
Like, it was like, you know, yeehaw, here you go. And like, we were going to help them in some way by handing them out money. Or um, and what really was happening was we were going down there to build things. And, and so the idea was we were going to go do something for them. We were going to help them with a particular thing. We were going to feed them. We we're going to, uh, we're going to provide shelter for them. We we're going to build a school for them. That was, that's what I think of with help, right? I think of what sometimes we say, hey, can you help me with something? It's usually somebody helping us to do something we cannot do for ourselves, right? It's almost like a physical task. But this idea of help was something more. Was something more. It's not about the food that we can serve or the houses that we can build or the wells that we can dig. Though those things are incredibly great. And I'm not knocking short-term mission trips. They're, they're a tremendous thing to go and to see how others live to one, to see how blessed we are, but to actually be part of bringing a blessing to someone else. But oftentimes, we're content to just do the work. Sometimes it's just easier for us to do the work, isn't it? And, and I'm saying sometimes it's easier for, for us to do the work than to say something. It's easier for us to do the work than to communicate something to someone else. But Paul, as he goes to help, the conclusion that he came to when he goes to Macedonia it isn't to build something. It isn't to dig something. It's not to feed someone. It's not that. In verse 10, it said, God had called us to preach the gospel to them. This help is beyond physical work. It's something incredibly more. Now, if we're honest, I think many of us, again, would say we'd rather just lend the hand. We'll lend the hand. We'll do something. We'll, we'll, we'll work. But I don't want to talk. Maybe that's your fear. And in fact, this even gets, uh, it gets worse right because so the call there's a call to preach the gospel and as we'll see in scripture it it goes out to all of us but i think what happens is that preaching this idea of preaching becomes the job of the pastor it becomes the job of the ones that went to seminary it becomes the job of the ones who have an education that's greater than mine if somebody were to tell you that your job was to preach my guess is you would shudder my guess is you would, you would shrink back. It's not something that we would easily do. Use our words to tell somebody of the gospel. If we're honest, we like to leave the preaching to professionals. But like Paul, we're called apostles. We're called to be disciples of Christ, followers of Christ, children of the Most High. And we are given the task of, of proclaiming, of preaching the gospel. You are given the call as followers through faith in Jesus Christ to preach. To preach. Now the word for preach the gospel isn't just what I'm doing here. Not all of us are called to stand on a pulpit in front of a whole lot of people and, and, and proclaim the gospel there. That's not it. Preaching is more than just this. It happens in so many more uh, different places. If you would have told me in high school that I would be a preacher standing in front of you, that would be like, it, that would be death for me. Because I remember those debates or like, I was totally fine disrupting a classroom from behind the class. I was okay with the sarcastic comments and the jokes and whatever in the back of the class, but if you stood me up in front and I had to give you an intelligible argument, that was the worst. Public speaking, I think, is, is people's greatest fear, second only to death, right? And so um, this isn't what I'm, what I'm saying. It's not, it's not this. However, there could be somebody in this room that God is calling one day to become a preacher. It could be one of our kids. It could be one of our youth that God is working in, in your life. Maybe He's working in your life to say, this is something I have for you. That could be there. But this idea of preaching isn't just this. That, so the Greek word for preach the gospel simply means to proclaim the good message. Proclaim a good message. I mean, there's so many times where we proclaim good things, right? 
Do you realize that every uh, d- during our holidays when we say Merry Christmas, that's a good proclamation. You realize that, right? We're proclaiming something good. When we tell somebody happy birthday, it's a proclamation. We're proclaiming it's somebody's birthday. We're celebrating it. We make all sorts of proclamations. This one is to proclaim the gospel story. And each of us has one. Each of us has a story of how God has rescued us, has forgiven us of our sin. Each of us has a story of a place where He's brought us. Each of us has a story of how God is working in our lives and how He has been working in our lives for maybe a long time. Each of us has a proclamation to make. The forgiveness of sins is ours through Jesus Christ. The story of Good Friday, His death, and the resurrection on Easter Sunday, that is my proclamation. That is your proclamation. He did that for you. That's good news for you. He washed away your sin. That is a good proclamation. And this is good news to be proclaimed to all. Do you know there's many that are, that are struggling day after day in this world with their own sin, with their own brokenness, with their own anxieties, with their own troubles of all kinds who desperately need to hear the proclamation of the good news. They need to hear good news. Even those whose lives seem to be just swell. My guess is in the quiet moments of, of every one of their days, they have, they have a desire to hear the good news that they desperately need to hear there's something more than just this life, just this here on earth. There's something more. They need to hear the story of good news. And so we see in our text that when called, Paul responds. He goes. He goes to Macedonia. And he does it through faith. He leaves Troas and he sets sail for Philippi, which is a city in Macedonia. And he says that Paul and his in it, the text says that Paul and his companions they made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to the Neapolis, and from there to Philippi. Now, in the Greek, another really cool thing it says that they made direct voyage. The Greek word in there is actually a sailing term. And it's talking about not having to, uh, not having to, uh, what's the word for it here? To tack. So when, when, the, when the wind isn't favorable, you tack and you go back and forth so that you can make progress. This is saying they made direct voyage, meaning the wind was at their back and they went. It was almost as if one, uh, one author said it was as though God was speeding their vessel forward himself. How cool is that? That when God calls, He leads. He gives exactly what is needed. And they made this direct voyage in their vessel. The wind at their backs, moving them to where He wanted them to be. And for the purpose of His glory alone. Now in the verses that follow, we see this coming to fruition. That Paul's course of action when he would visit a place was to go to the synagogue first, but uh, because, uh, because this was a Roman colony and, and Judaism was kind of outlawed in that time and there weren't uh, 10 believers in Jewish, uh, from a Jewish audience perspective, a synagogue was established when, they were, when there were 10 Jewish male believers in a place, then they would have a synagogue. Uh, and there was no synagogue. They went looking for a synagogue to preach in, as was Paul's custom when he went to a new place, but they couldn't find a synagogue. And so he goes to the water. He goes to the water. Um, He goes to this river, a place that was known as a place of prayer. And it was here that Paul met a group of women who had come together, one of them being Lydia. I kind of wish, whenever I hear Lydia, I just hear her whiny, cartoonish voice. Are you here to see me? I feel like, I feel like that's how they responded to Paul. Um, so anyway, they, uh, they go to this place of prayer, which is by the river. They meet Lydia, who was uh, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. Now, from what we know of Lydia, she was a wealthy woman. Uh, she had means. She had her own home. 
Uh, there's a lot of things that talk about she was, she was well-to-do. She had a lucrative vi- uh, business in, in uh, selling purple goods. So the thing with purple goods is there was a dye that was in, in a certain kind of fish or shellfish that they would extract, and they would, it was a powerful dye that they would dye garments with, and it was the best dye that they could get. But it was hard to come by. So when you could do it, when you could get it, you could harvest it, it was expensive, hence why she, she was well-to-do well to do. But she was also a Jew. It says that she was a worshiper of God. She knew God. However, she didn't yet know Christ. She didn't yet know the fulfillment that came in Christ for her. Now what's interesting is that Paul had this vision of a man in Macedonia who said, come and help us. Lydia is not a woman who needed physical help. And she's certainly not the man that God had shown Paul in the vision at night. Philippi was not where Paul wanted to go. But it's at this place, with these women, that the gospel is proclaimed and received by Lydia. The first recorded convert in Europe. She's the first recorded convert in Europe. As they proclaim the gospel, the story of Christ, in verse 14 it says that God opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. She listened to Paul's story. She heard the proclamation of the same good news that Paul heard himself. He shared it. And she believed it. She received it for herself. So much so that it says, it's just a funny line in here, that um, she says, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. She beat them down so that they would stay with her to carry out their ministry. She was so touched that, that she wanted even to use her possession in her place that God had provided for her as a center for this to be, this good news to be proclaimed. Just on an interesting note, go ahead and read the book of Philippians. This is Philippi. This is ministry that happens there. This is part of the Philippian church. And Lydia had a big part of it. And God led Paul there. This woman who needed no physical help needed desperately to hear the gospel. She needed spiritual help. She needed to hear the proclamation of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for her. And Paul used that message, his message, his story, to bring her into the kingdom of heaven. All for God's glory. Not on Paul's own, but as Paul was led by God, led by the Holy Spirit to do this incredible work. None of this was Paul and his companions' plan. This isn't how they had it mapped out, what they looked like, their, had their ministry looking like. This wasn't what they thought it would be. But Paul was called to preach the gospel. He was called to preach the gospel. Not to who he thought and not where he thought. He was called to proclaim this message. He didn't evaluate whether he had the right words or not to speak to these women. He didn't wait for a larger or even smaller group. He went and proclaimed the gospel. He didn't vow only to speak at people who were at a synagogue, but yet found this group by the river at a place of prayer. He went to proclaim the gospel. And this is the same call that Paul gives us as believers. He will give us direct passage. He will move in us. He will give you the words that you think you don't have. Do you think for a moment that my friend, that director down there, um, was do, thought he was doing God's work by saying, oh, if you go, I'll pay. You know, this man was very blessed by the Lord and, and used, uses his finances for an incredible thing. But did, for a moment, just to think, like being available... Being able just to utter those words set me on a course to be even where I am today simply because he was willing to obey what the Lord had been telling him and showing him. 
He'll do the same in and through our lives. He will move through us as we talk to our family, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, all that we come in contact with. He will use our words to bring the gospel to them. He wants to bring this story of good news to them for His glory, that they might see Him for who He is. And so He calls us to proclaim it. Now this isn't something that we do on our own power. It's not at all something that we do on our own power. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, we have a call, a commission. It says, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. That's not a, if you get around to it, if you find the time, if you feel comfortable enough, go do this. There's no qualifiers. He's he's called us to do this. But he also says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of of the earth. The Holy Spirit will lead. The Holy Spirit will guide. He will do something incredible. It's interesting when Paul speaks to the Corinthians, he talks about he he resolved to know nothing except for Christ and Christ crucified, and later he calls it folly. It's foolishness to those who are perishing, but it's it's the gift of God to those who believe. And there's so many times where I'll leave even preaching on a Sunday morning and drive home, Pastor another Pastor Warren, a word of wisdom, he said, the longest ride is the ride home Sunday after church. Because you think of all the things you should have said and, and how you said it, and, and you think, oh man, I could have done a better job, and you get, you get so uh, bummed out, right? Um, and there's so many times where we feel like we fail with our words, but God is behind them. And inevitably, I'll get somebody that that sends me a message saying, you know, that's exactly what I needed to hear. That was such an incredible blessing. Even though I thought I was up here going like this, somehow God makes it work. So have no fear. Proclaim the gospel. Proclaim the story of Jesus Christ and what He has done for you. Share it. God, who is behind it all, will make it fruitful. And He will receive all the glory. But we must first hear His call to us to go. His call for us is to go and to preach. To proclaim. To be proclaimers of His Word. You are called to proclaim His grace to the world around you. He sends you to the world around you. And He goes with you. He sends His Spirit to be in you to do the work that you cannot do on your own. That is such a comfort. It is such a peace to know that God will do it. And so our call is to go, to go, to proclaim. Don't just do the works. Those things are good. But speak with your mouth the good news of Jesus Christ. Tell others of what He has done for you. This is what we're called to do. And so this is simply a reminder to us all. Preach the gospel, proclaim the gospel, and He will do the rest. Would you pray with me? Father, we ask that You would use us to proclaim. And Father, we ask that You would, through our imperfect words, do a perfect work of drawing men to Yourself. We pray that You would help us to be the ones who are so overwhelmed with the forgiveness of sins that we can't help but to tell others where to find freedom, where to find peace, where to find hope. Lord, this is proclamation. This is preaching. That we would share this good news with the world around us. And so, Father, we ask that You would give us boldness and help us to see that Your promise of the Holy Spirit will go with us, that You will work through us, that You will give us success, not for our sake, but for Your own. And so, Father, we ask that You would loosen our tongues, make us willing to speak, even if it isn't what we want to do, who we want to talk to, how we want to do it, where we want to do it, Lord, we pray that You would help us to see 
you moving us by the power of your Spirit, doing a great work for the sake of the kingdom. Father, we need you to do this in us. And we're grateful that you do it freely. Help us to remember that this week and every day following. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Evan. Please stand with us. Proclaim the gospel. Share it. Share it with those around you. Tell them your story. There's nothing that you don't have the right words. You don't need the right words when you're telling your story about how God has rescued you. And that will speak volumes to the world around us as they hear of his glory. 
Receive this benediction and the hope that comes with it from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings fall. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.